All right. Hello, everyone. We'll start. Uh, again, this slide deck is available online. If you don't decide to download it right now, you'll have the opportunity at the end as well. But I'm Doug Soltes. This is Clay Gerard. And today we are talking about building applications with OpenStack Swift. And so to start your journey, we're going to give you a list of things that you will need to accomplish. And so the first step is figuring out why you're going to use OpenStack Swift in the first place. So I would argue that the best two things about OpenStack Swift is number one, it's API. It's API is different than a file system or a block system. And the reason why is that you can access it from anywhere. You don't need a VPN tunnel. We're not using SIFS or NFS. It's its own protocol. It uses the REST API and it's going to give developers more control. And so what do I mean by that? Well, some of that Clay's going to talk about in just a couple of minutes, but you have advanced commands like server-side copy, versioning, object expiration, things that no file system can normally do. And it puts it in the hands of the developers. In fact, the, the developers are able to choose something like a storage policy. A storage policy says, well, where will my data reside? Is it going to be just in this data center? Is it going to be in multiple data centers? Is my data going to be in a certain tier of storage? And these are not things that you can normally do when we're talking about a block or file system. Now, why choose OpenStack Swift as the underlying storage in addition to the Swift API, because there are definitely a lot of systems out there today that have slapped the Swift API on top of a, uh, a strongly consistent system. And it's because OpenStack Swift was designed from the ground up to actually be a system that can scale to terabytes, petabytes, exabytes. It's eventually consistent. It's able to handle massive uh, failures. So you can lose a data center, a rack, multiple <laughs> nodes, multiple data centers. The replication is simple. You put the data in, and it automatically replicates. Some people are afraid of eventual consistency. You shouldn't be. That protects you in case the system becomes split brain. What it says is when I put an object in, it may not be in all my data centers. But if you want to access it, you better believe that the proxies know how to statelessly find that data and access it. So you're in good hands on this quest. There are a lot of other super users in the OpenStack space that have used object storage and have built a great ecosystem on not just OpenStack and its projects, but specifically OpenStack Swift. As well as a large number of commercial products that have adopted the OpenStack, Swift, <clears throat> the OpenStack Swift API in their product to allow their users to have increased functionality. So now let me give you a quest. And this is one that I personally worked on. So you're a moving and storage company. You decide that you're going to roll out tablets. You think all of your truck drivers should have tablets because it's going to make you more efficient. The paperwork won't get lost. You won't spill coffee on it. In fact, you'll be able to do new things you never did before, like take pictures of chairs and tables if they're already broken or scratched. The condition of the house when you get there so that they can't claim that you, know, you broke that door or that hinge or that window was not right before or after the movers came. But that's a lot of data. On each move, you're going to generate up to a gigabyte of data. And you know what? Roaming charges in the US for 4G data can be kind of expensive, maybe not roaming, but transmitting all that data. The only data you actually care about in immediate fashion is the actual form data so that you can start billing that move immediately. All those videos and files, you want them to stay on the tablet until the tablet actually makes it back to one of your service centers. And each of these service centers is going to be running OpenStack Swift. And so what's going to happen? The driver is going to walk in the door. It's going to pick up the Wi-Fi network. And it's immediately going to transmit all of those photos to the object storage on site. Why? Because all of the object storage has the same global namespace. It's nice and simple from an operator point of view. Now, you don't need the same amount of data in each of those data centers. You're going to have a lot of data in your New Jersey, and your California, your primary, and your DR site. And so when you walk in the door, we're going to use what we call write affinity, and you're going to write all the data to the data center right there in, say, Chicago. And then over time, it's going to trickle out to those other data centers. It's going to be protected and highly available when it's actually needed, and it's going to save you a whole ton of money. Now, maybe you're not a, a moving company. Maybe you have video cameras. In fact, a lot of universities, municipalities, uh, police forces are now installing more and more video cameras. And these generate a ton of data. 
and you want to store it very economically. In fact, one HD camera generates 86 gigabytes of data a day. So you can imagine if you have 12 cameras, that's a petabyte a day. And a lot of people have more than 12 cameras and they want to keep it for 90 days. So again, assuming that you want to build a system on commodity hardware that's extremely economical and is resilient to failure so that you can have it in multiple data centers, the cameras can write to any of those data centers. And yet if one data center goes down, all the camera footage is still being captured, whether that's Las Vegas or your small office, then you're covered with OpenStack Swift. So in order to do these quests, you're gonna to have to first pick a language. And so you're lucky, this community has been around for several years and there's several SDKs. So if you like Go or Python, we know that Python is the, the normal language for, for OpenStack. But if you're a Java developer, then guess what? You've got tools at your disposal today, libraries that you can import and start consuming easily OpenStack Swift and writing it into your program. But if your language isn't up on screen or you like different Java libraries, you're okay too because all the modern languages today will have a, a curl library or something like a, a request library that you can use standard HTML commands and you'll be able to pass headers, do gets, puts, all the normal RESTful commands. And so with that, I'm actually going to accelerate this talk. I'm assuming that everybody in the room is already familiar with object storage is. In fact, I see a bunch of core developers for Swift anyway. And so we're gonna pass the CRUD and we're going to jump straight to Clay. If you do need more information though, we have a book come by the OpenStack or the Swiss Stack booth and we're glad to give it out. And meanwhile, the, uh, the talks from Tokyo and Vancouver have been recorded for Swift 101. Hi guys, uh, my name is Clay, I work on Swift. And I'm gonna to talk to you guys about a, a few, I'm just gonna, I'm like randomly picked a couple of uh, API topics. Uh, one of the things that we found doing these sums for a while is uh, we'll go through, you know, basic Swift architecture, how to use the API and get some puts. And there's, I mean, there's, it, there's really not a lot to talk about that we can cover it in a, in a single session. Uh, but now we're starting to build up a collection of series that we've done. And on this one, we're picking up a few new API topics where, you know, between maybe three or four of our sessions, you can sort of really get into that Swift 201, the next level of uh, API topics. And um, what we're going to get into to start off with is static large objects, which is one of the, uh, one of the methods that Swift has for supporting uploading a large object. So you have a, a single object that exceeds five gigs, uh, or maybe, you know, maybe it's not huge, but you want to break it up into del delineated parts. You just sort of segment it up. Uh, it's up to the application how it wants to chunk those up. And it can break all of them up using its local storage and upload all of the pieces concurrently into the object storage. And then you give Swift some additional information, a manifest file uh, that explains how it's stored. So you'll just present a single big file exe, but it's broken out in into all these little chunks. So, slows are great. Uh, we, uh, static large objects, uh, we abbreviate them uh, slows. And um, they have all of the characteristics that you would get out of the API of a normal object. Uh, but it allows you some benefits. Uh, one of the first ones that you're gonna see is that you can break it up into smaller pieces, upload them all concurrently. This is gonna improve your throughput. If you have huge data sets, multiple terabyte data images, genomics data is one of the use cases that we have here. Uh, you can chop that up into 100 megabyte chunks and just upload thousands and thousands of those little pieces and then in a single put at the end you can assemble them all back together with this JSON file and we're going to get into the uh, semantics of that uh, and it allows you the uh, user to just be presented with what they feel like to be a single huge object what they can use range request to pull into the middle uh, it's got a great API for validating your manifest it can give you back errors that are specific which chunks what's the problems um, and stitch it all together. If you're using the Swift command line client, which I'm sure a lot of people that have used Swift before are familiar with, uh, then, then it's really simple. You just throw the dash dash use SLO flag in there when you give it a segment size, and that'll allow you to upload your object into a segment container. It handles all of that, splitting it up, doing multiple puts concurrently. Um, and then, you know, there's also a lot of other uh, utilities out there. Swiftly, uh, there's another one, uh, Swift Commander. Uh, Fred Hutch uh, is uh, one of the IT personnel working at uh, Fred Hutch uh, Cancer uh, uh, Research Institute. So uh, there's another one there. There's lots of them. Uh, a lot of those SDKs that Doug was alluding to also get into, they have kind of built-in support for some of these things. So you can have access to these features without having to know all the nitty-gritties. But 
uh, you may have reasons for wanting to do it on your own. And we're going to take a look at a little bit about what makes up these, these segments. So here you can see a blob of JSON. If you kind of pull it apart, you can see it's just a list of JSON objects, dictionaries in, uh, in Python. Uh, the three keys that are really important are the path, which says, you know, what is the name of this segment? It's, it's a name to another object in Swift. Uh, and that's the path. That first segment there is going to be the container, followed by however many you know pre, uh, different uh, container paths that make up the full object name, the canonical name of the object. That's the first segment. Uh, you notice it's a list, so these are order specific. The order that they're presented in is going to be the order that they get stitched back together. And then it also provides some metadata about that object, the size and the e tag. And that information is what allows different kinds of validation and range requests and and you know validating of the object when it's being served out. If there's any sort of error in downloading it to the client, this can be detected. And this is a huge advantage over uh, a previous uh, implementation uh, that also has some unique characteristics, dynamic large objects. So with static large objects, it's great. Um, now, normally, those fields, the e tags and the size bytes, we want the client to send that along. They should have all of that contextual information. They just uploaded the segments. They can present that to Swift, and Swift can do some validation to make sure, OK, yeah, make sure I have everything. Everything's accessible. Everything checks out. I got this static large object just as you specified it. Um, but it does add some overhead and bookkeeping to the client. Uh, and the API has recently, in a, in a recent release of Swift, been extended. And you no longer have to fill in that information. You do still need to explicitly state that you are not sending it. Uh, this is a different from an error. You forgot to send these keys. But if you send in the nulls, uh, you know, Python dictionary with nuns, and, and then uh, convert it to JSON, and they come in as nulls, uh, Swift will uh, still be able to validate those objects. It'll go pull in all the segments and check everything for you and stitch it back together and say, OK, I've got it. And when it writes the manifest down, it will fill in all that information. So a client later can download that manifest uh, and use that information to do uh, comparison to a local object that they have that's represented by that static large object to do if there's maybe something in the middle of it changed and you need to rewrite one of those segments and then update the manifest to note that this part in the middle has been replaced. Uh, but once you get ready to put it, it's more or less like a regular put. You just upload the JSON to Swift. You do have to include this extra bit of query string here. Uh, to indicate uh, that this is a put for a, a static large object manifest. And uh, it'll include some additional object metadata on there to say x uh, static large object true. Uh, so if you're ever looking at a manifest, if you just have the headers, if you do a head on it, you can tell if it's a static large object manifest or a dynamic large object manifest by looking at those two headers. You've got the uh, x static large object true, or you have x object manifest in the case of DLOs. Um, now, a little note on DLOs. Was you, did you have a question? Well, um, do any of the clients, is there any way to clients? Yeah, absolutely. So for example, the Swift command line client, that's natively how it's going to do it. When you say uh, use SLOs and you give it an object and a segment size, and that's a gigabyte object, and you say segment size is 10 megs, uh, it will on that object, open up multiple readers, seeked out to all the right points, and they'll concurrently, a default to 10 threads at a time, be pushing up uh, the segments concurrently. And a lot of the SDKs, an example, uh, have this sort of stuff built in. In the Swift command line client, its underlying service, the Swift services API, uh, has a way to do this sort of work programmatically, uh, where you get a context manager, and you can load it up with a bunch of different types of requests, and then you can stream off those responses as you consume it. Uh, so there's a lot of client support for that. Uh, depending on your language or your project needs, uh, maybe we can help you find something that you need. Yeah, so Fred Hutch, uh, who wrote the Swift Commander, they manipulate large genomic files. They're able to take a uh, human genome, which is about 150 gigabytes, and send it up and fill a 10 gig pipe with that single file. Wow, that was a fast deck. Yes, preview. Uh, and that's not something you can do with a normal filer, right? So if you have a 150 gig file and you want to copy it, and you're sending it over SIFs or NFS, what you need to do is send multiple of those files to try to fill a 10 gig pipe. So, you know, the ability of Swift to break something into pieces and reassemble it can give you massive gains in throughput when you're trying to do research. And that really folds into Hadoop and, and other stories as well. Yeah. Well, as, as long as you have a bunch of uh, file blocking file I.O. mixed in there, uh, the Python threads and the global interpreter will interact 
successfully in order to, to have those concurrently, even though only one object will actually be doing uh, network I.O. at the time, uh, while the other threads are, are doing the, the file I.O. So it, maybe we talk about it more later. I, I mean, you're, you're certainly right. There is some interaction there that is I important, but uh, other languages, of course, don't have that limitation, and there's other ways that you can do things in Python as well. But I do want to say, DLOs are awesome. They predate uh, static large objects, uh, but you know, there was even a thread on the OpenStack mailing list not that long ago where someone was sort of you know, struggling about with some of the, the nature of the dynamic nature of the large object support and the original implementation doesn't lend itself well to some of the types of use cases where you need to really sort of be able to manipulate what is this object. So just in general, just you know, start with the static large objects if you're doing large objects, and then only if that fails you for some reason, if you've got one of those weird niche cases where you're doing logs and you need to continually stream up new data into the object uh, is the only time when you'd really need DLOs. So start with SLOs, and then only when that doesn't work for you. Uh, Doug made me write a script to convert a DLO to an SLO, so just get rid of them. So that's your bonus, that's your Easter egg on yes. this. Um, okay, next random feature, uh, we're going to talk about uh, authorization. Uh, so account ACLs is a relatively new feature. I mean, it's been out in a number of releases, but it doesn't have as large of adoption. Uh, there's a lot, especially at these OpenStack conferences, uh, people are using identity management systems that were built and designed for cloud use cases, where you know every resource that you're defining in the cloud, you want to put some information about who can access it in the identity management system. But in the legacy and enterprise, use cases, there's not always, they don't have a cloud-based identity management system. They have something that's, you know, defining, you know, who a person is, what teams they're a member of and their roles, uh, maybe in an LDAP system or something like that. And then they leave it up to the resources themselves to identify based off of those users and those roles who has access. Account ACLs is an extension of that idea. In Swift, on the account itself, you can set these users, these groups have access to it. Rather than having to say in the identity management system, that this user has access to this Swift account. So you, le you already have to store the resources in Swift. It needs to have those accounts there for billing and everything else. Account ACLs is a way that you can store that. It has a little bit different syntax. Uh, it may not affect a lot of you guys, but you know, if you have a legacy auth system and you're you know, encountering some of these issues where you don't really have a way to tie all of the cloud resources back to your identity management system, uh, sometimes there's a way to flip it around and, and let the resources themselves define which users and groups have access to them. Uh, and that's why account ACLs exist. But generally speaking, working with Swift, you're much more likely to encounter the container ACLs. Uh, so it's the same sort of concept. Within an account, you have multiple containers. Each one of those containers can individually sort of define who has access to it. Uh, containers are the natural way in Swift to group objects together. Uh, in your single account, in your project, in your tenant, you might have uh, you know, a million objects, 10 million objects, uh, and they're going to be grouped per more than likely into separate containers. Each one of those containers is a group of objects, and you can set behaviors of the or object storage system uh, around this group of objects by placing metadata on the container. The Container ACLs is, is an example of that. If you have a group of objects in a container and you want to make those publicly accessible, um, what you can use is through container ACLs, you set the refer, uh, refer uh, spelt correctly here, although in HTTP parlance it's normally missing one of those R's, uh, has to do with who is the guy that's requesting the object. And uh, because Swift is storage built for the web, you see a lot of these HTTP-isms sort of bleeding their way into the, the Swift API. It, it takes advantage of a lot of web clients. So for example, if you embed a URL, you know, an a href, a, a anchor tag href uh, to an image, or image tag in one of your web pages, and that points to a URL that's in Swift, in a container that you've marked publicly accessible, the web browser, uh, for your benefit, will send along the refer, what was the originating website that was uh, making this request. And Swift can use that information. It's, it's sort of opt-in. I mean, you can get around it with curl, but when the information is available, you can use that in order to uh, allow or deny that. Uh, so if you know that you have this public content and you have a web application that is generating um, references to images that are stored in your Swift cluster, you know that a well-behaved client 
accessing that through any web browser, I mean, even way back into the Netscape old days, like it will send those that refer header along, and you can trust that to authorize that request. Oh, or you can just put a splat on it, which is uh, what everybody does. Uh, it makes it totally accessible. It's not any more or less restrictive, protected than the refer thing. Like I said, it's kind of opt-in anyways. The client doesn't have to send that. Uh, and when you put a splat on it, anybody can get those objects. You just point your web browser at your Swift cluster, and you can look at those objects. But just like uh, in Nginx, uh, whenever you have some content that's laying on disk and you know, there's no restrictions there, I mean, maybe you can put basic auth in front of it or something, but generally you have your web server and it's pointing at some data. If you, you know, go to that path, you've set your you know, web, www root path to some section of the file system on disk and you go to a particular object, it'll load that up. But if you delete the object path and just go back to the directory that's holding all of those, by default, I mean, unless you've enabled uh, you know, web mode or something like this, uh, you will not get an object. You'll you know, say you're not authorized to view this listing and that's the default operation on a container. So if you're using public access, you may also, if you want to allow it, uh, our listing is another, and here you can see the example uh, of a container ACL and it's just a CSV. Uh, you can give explicit access to users uh, or an explicit refer, an explicit deny refer, uh, and then the, um, the listings tag. So here's an example with curl. Most things that you might want to do to an HTTP API you can do with curl. If you're not familiar with curl syntax, it's not super intuitive, but we're just sending a header for authorization, and then we're setting another header, which is that comma-separated value list of all of the ACLs, and we send that directly to the URL of the container. So it's your storage URL slash your container name, which you make up. Um, this is an example of uh, allowing write access. Um, so back onto the listings and back onto large objects. There's some synergy here in different components of the API. Dynamic large objects, uh, one of the limitations with them is that in order to generate the full object, it has to be able to do a listing. So if you're trying to make a dynamic large object manifest, uh, publicly accessible, you can't just give that manifest and its segments the read option. That's the, um, the splat star. You also have to enable the listings option on the dynamic large objects. Uh, segmented container. So this is another reason why uh, with segmented objects you have some advantage because the components that make up the large object are explicitly listed. There's not a container listing step. Uh, you just have to be able to retrieve the object. You just have to be able to retrieve the manifest. So watch out. Um, but you know, ACLs are not the only way. I mean, that's like a one-time thing. You unlock the keys of the kingdom, you can get into every object in that container, uh, which, you know, we talked about how you normally use containers to sort of group different things together, but if you need more granular control, like all the way down to a specific object or a specific, you know, object, large object manifest, uh, you can use another tool for granting temporary access uh, to an object. So uh, you have access to all the different kind of verbs. You can do it to any, you know, URL that you, any object URL that you have in the system. Uh, you have some different tools in there and how it's managed. Again, you, it's metadata that you set on the container or on the account. There's two different kinds. We'll talk about both account and container temp URLs. Uh, but they follow basically the same idea. Uh, there's a temp URL key, but also a temp URL key two, so you can support rotation uh, without worrying about expiring uh, or invalidating a bunch of uh, keys that you've given out in the interim while you're doing the update. So you set your temp URL key, uh, then you can do another request which takes your old temp URL key and sets it to temp URL key two. And then you replace it with your new temp URL key, and you make that single request, setting both of them. So you change the, the, the uh, you set the, the old, the two here to be your backup key. That's the one that, you know, your application may have recently given out the keys, and then you set the new one. Uh, and then any incoming requests that are still signed with the old key can still be validated. Now, this is different, of course, if you want to, you know, immediately revoke all of those keys. Uh, you could just, you know, change the, the, the temp URL key to something new, and anything that had gotten previously handed out is immediately no longer valid. It doesn't matter what you set the expiration time to, because that needs to, the key that originally signed the request needs to be able to be validated on the resource. Uh, we're going to go into the syntax of how you create these HMACs to sign these keys, uh, but you also have some help, again. Uh, you, the Swift command line client and a bunch of other tools support this stuff. Yes, sir? Maybe not? Yeah, 
Yeah, it seems seems reasonable. I haven't had anybody ask me for uh, SHA-256, but SHA-256 probably should thrown out too, so, you know. Um, yeah, I think uh, right n now it would probably just be a sort of thing where you could uh, set it whenever you sign it. You'd have to add something to say which algorithm that you... Uh, uh, well actually, yeah, maybe you'd extend it. I don't know. Might be, a, might be something to discuss on, on what would be the best way to, to implement it, uh, users to be able to select different things. Uh, so, but the HMAC generation looks like this. Uh, generally, HMAC uh, validation looks like this. You, there are some required fields that you need to make an HMAC. You have to give it the key. Uh, you have to give it the body of the, the, the body that you're signing, uh, and then the, the algorithm. Like, uh, as our friend was pointing out, there's multiple algorithms supported, uh, supported uh, in general, uh, although you know, Swift has simplified to, to, to SHA-1. Um, uh, but so that's what you need to do, the key, the body, and the shell one. Now you see in the body, we actually encode a couple of pieces of information. Uh, this would be an example body. This is, the, this is the, the body of the HMAC that you would actually sign with the request using the key that you set, one of the two keys that you set on either your account or your container. Uh, and you can do it here. You can also do it on the uh, command line. OpenSSL has some built-in support uh, to do that. Uh, so, but you fill in your body like this, the method, the full path, notice it includes the version URL, if there ever is a new version of Swift and a different paths have different semantic meanings, uh, it's important that we encode the full path to the uh, request that you have authorized. Uh, and then the expires time. Uh, on the command line utilities, I don't know if I did an example, but on the command line utilities, you normally set uh, expires after. You think about, like, I want to make this and I want to authorize it for three hours or something like that. But uh, the actual body of the request that needs to be signed is the expires at, you need to say, uh, when the temp URL expires. That's a Unix timestamp. It's just, you know, time dot time plus however long you want it to be. So that's what you fill in, you sign that, and then that'll be your, your HMAC. Um, and then the HMAC is part of the signature that you hand out to your clients. So you just give them, you know, HTTP, my storage server, this full path with a query string, including the temp URL signature, and then the expire, the temp URL expires is sent in the, the plain text. This is one of the inputs to that signature. So there's no communication that goes on with the storage system and some third party authorization system. It has all of the information it needs embedded in this signature that you signed with your keys in order to authorize the request. And you can see here we're setting the uh, X account meta temp URL key uh, to my secret key. Uh, once that information is set on your account or, or on your container, you can then generate temp URL signatures using the, per, this uh, formula here uh, to sign, create signed requests that you can give out to customers. And you can allow them to store an object in the storage system via put request, uh, or you can make a git that they can download the object or do range requests on it. Um, and yeah, so there's a read. You can notice no headers, X auth, anything, right? You just put in the entire uh, URL, including the query string, and it's able to serve that directly out of Swift. Hey, Clay, can I ask a question? Yes. So the, uh, on that last slide right there, the, that actual request is going to be protected also by the HTTPS, correct? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you've signed it, you've used SHA-1 to sign it, and so I don't disagree that SHA-1's um, there are, there are better algorithms, but you're going to be protected within that with the whatever SSL you know keys you're yeah. using. Yeah, you'd be subject to replay if anybody uh, you know ever got a hold of these. But uh, you're presumably passing them out through also a secure channel, SQL. HTTPS mm -hmm. or, or whatever. So, uh, but you know, if you email it to somebody, it does have that expires on there, so it's only good for so long. Um, but yeah, they do what they do. So uh, containers, uh, you know, we love the containers and it recently got some love in a recent release. We've now expanded with uh, container temp URLs. So with container temp URLs, you know, it's a lot of the same things that work with account URLs. You set that X, uh, let me see if I can do it here, X container meta temp URL key or temp URL key two. Uh, you can set those on your containers and it's a little bit different, um, uh, what do they call that, attack surface. Uh, everything is limited scoped to the container. You can uh, only only create temp URLs with, with the container temp URL key for objects that are in that container. Uh, any temp URL that you create with your container temp URL key can only authorize requests that go into that container. Uh, 
So like, for example, a static large object, uh, if you give someone a temp URL to that manifest, sub requests that go into you know, different objects that make up that, that static large object will be pre-authorized by that temp URL. So if you have an account level temp URL, you can have a, uh, a manifest sitting there and you create a temp URL for it and then you can hand that back and they can go get that whole uh, static large object as if it was a single object, everything is, is authorized. But if you do it with a, um, uh, container temp URL, uh, it, you won't be able to authorize those those sub requests. So this is another another gotcha. If you if you do a container temp URL, the large object must have all of its segments inside of that same container, or there is no way to create a container temp URL that authorizes that static large uh, that that large object manifest that points to data that's in another container because container temp URLs are always scoped to only that container. So if you can lay out you know, your data and keep everything in a certain container, you have this smaller surface area, the smaller domain that you can control with a single set of keys. All right, uh, range reads. Um, this is another HTTP-ism that's made its way into the Swift API. Um, you don't have to download the entire object, you can just download a portion of the object. Um, a lot of different uh, HTTP tools that already expect to be talking to web services already use these sorts of things. Uh, one of the biggest use cases is probably HTTP pseudo streaming. Uh, this is why you can upload a video into Swift and then take any HTML5 browser, Chrome, newer Firefox, just point it at that URL. Maybe you, presumably you made it public with either a uh, temp URL or a uh, um, uh, public uh, container ACLs. And so now you have this public video that's in your Swift cluster. So you point your newer browser at that URL and you can do all of your little, you know, you skip into the middle of the video and start resuming playing from the middle of the place. And that's just the power of HT HTML5 uh, and the way that it does videos, but it's doing it using this HTTPism that's existed via range requests where it can seek out into the middle of a video and just start playing from there. It's a byte range offset. Uh, if you know some stuff about uh, video streaming, the time-based offsets were all the rage back in the day uh, and uh, uh, those aren't natively supported through HTTP, it requires an extension, uh, but with range reads you get a lot of players that are able to work just natively pointing right at Swift. Um, you also do um, multi-range, uh, all covered in RFC 2616 or whatever it's been replaced by now, um, but uh, you can have a single request requesting multiple byte ranges, uh, like for example maybe if you have an MP3 and you want to get the metadata for the player, uh, the name of the artist and that sort of thing, that's all in the first uh, few bytes, uh, but then you also want to get a 30 second sample of the chorus somewhere out in the middle of the object, you can do a single request, get back two ranges, it's all packed together in a MIME document uh, from back in the email days, multi-part MIMES, um, and I'll have an example of one of those, it looks kind of funny. Uh, but generally on a range request, you would just, uh, so here we uploaded an object, uh, and you do a range request, you specify just a range, and the get request will come back, and it just has your little bit. Um, and then here with a multi-part MIME, you can see, you know, that make that same range request, but you put on two ranges and the body of the request is very different. It comes back, you have this uh, terminator here that's included in the first few bytes. Uh, that's also in the headers telling the client parser what to look out for. And then you have these headers that describe this section of the content followed by the content. Another one of these delimitators, some more description of the next set of content, and then there's the second set of ranges. And then finally that same terminating character string which has been you know, uniquely selected. And again, that, that's, that's in the headers. Uh, but if you have a MIME parser in your library of Java or Python tools, uh, that'll mostly be handled for you. Um, Okay, so again, new, new, new Swift feature. I talked about container temp URLs was something that came out uh, in Liberty, uh, static large objects with ranges, slorges. We're so happy to have a word that rhymes with orange. Uh, it was really the main impetus for writing this feature. Um, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, we talked about static large objects. You have these manifests that describe this other object that doesn't really exist in the storage system. It's just, I've made a manifest that describes how you would construct such an object should it exist. And then I have all these chunks and all these pieces, a bunch of Legos. So with the static large objects with ranges inserted, then we've kind of added a new, a new piece to the kit so you can construct something else uh, 
Uh, in this situation, you may have an object that uh, is maybe some deduped block data that you put together. Or maybe you have a single object uh, that's, again, that MP3, and you want to create a manifest that doesn't require you know, a bunch of tricky range headers to build this, uh, this sample that includes the start of the song metadata, and then again, that 30-second sample down in the middle with the chorus. So you can create a static large object, and the pieces of this object are made up of uh, this object name, and then it, it takes this ranges, and it uses the same ranges. You, you still will include the, the E tag and the, the, the size of those, those ranges. Um, to describe the segment that's actually being made of, uh, but then you add all these pieces into a manifest and you can create something new that didn't exist before. Uh, so here we have uh, an example of a manifest. Oh, maybe we didn't fill that section in. Well, I don't know if we, we were swapping some slides around here lately, no, no, right we before. Did. So, uh, I'm sorry, what are you asking for? So at the top is a normal slow, yeah, and then there's the oh, new I see they're down at the bottom. slow, and then the bottom yeah. combines Thanks, the Doug. new nulls and bonus. It's all down here. This looked very familiar. Remember, it's exactly like the the previous one, uh, and then here is combining the new null feature and the the range request to create a, a new object. Well, uh, and that's a new thing that just just came out in Swift. Just added, yeah, just brand, brand new. Yeah. So you you think of a think of a use case for it. You want to do something deduping blocks or something and. Right? Yeah, so we're almost out of time, but there's plenty more to explore with the Swift API and the commands that you can use with it. Uh, in the Vancouver uh, OpenStack Summit, John Dickinson, the PTL, gave a great uh, speech. It's available online, and he includes subjects such as listing, temporals again, uh, form posting cores, bulk updates, and large objects. I also spoke at uh, OpenStack Vancouver, and I covered uh, a lot of middleware topics, including how to help check your cluster, cluster information, uh, object versioning, object exploration, um, a whole multitude of topics. So, you know, we're looking to add to that series, and we're very happy that earlier today, we both attended a session by Christian in the audience right now, who uh, did a great Django and um, Angular talk mm -hmm. on building web applications using OpenStack Swift. He had the code up and running. We don't have a web link for that, but I'm sure there'll be one probably within a day or two. Yeah, and we might be able to update these. Uh, yeah. I think we have the URL so you guys can get these, and we'll probably do something on our SwiftStack website. Uh, there is a lot of features to the, the Swift API, and there's really you know some creative ways that you can sort of combine things. You know, we we bumped into a couple of cases where we're talking about how static large objects are interacting with container ACLs, and sometimes there can be some tricks on how it can piece together, uh, but you know, uh, all of our Swift developers know a little bit about how these things sort of fit together. So if you have some use cases, you can hit us up. Uh, say I really need the SHA-256 in my temp URLs, maybe, or whatever your use case is, and we're happy to hear it and talk about what we can do to so, you know help make you be successful. Uh, there's also partners in the industry like SwiftStack. Uh, we have a lot of successful data architects that have worked with customers and how they want to design their data architecture and how they want to design their applications to use Swift and leverage it to the best of its ability, so they don't maybe like end up using DLOs when SLOs would have been a better fit for their use case. So it never hurts to have someone to you don't have to go it alone. Yeah, no. Well, thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, please let us know. Otherwise, again, you can download these slides. I know there was a lot of, you know, technical talk inside of it, so these are available online. Any questions? Nice. All right. Well, thank you for your time today.